Hey YouTube, Dustin Dolby here. Welcome back to our channel. Make sure to quickly thumb up the video and subscribe. Help us close in on 100K. So today we're running through our complete 360 degree product photography workflow using the MyOps Capsule 360 here and turntable combo, which is a nice setup. And this will simply rotate our product here. Now we're shooting a bracelet, which is glossy, it's matte. It's a simple item, but we still have to premeditate a lot of stuff. And it's a good example of you know, something you could be tasked to shoot in an e-commerce or Shopify setting. I'm newer to this type of photography, but I've been stuck inside for a while with this exact turntable unit playing around with it. So I thought we could build something up today. If you have any questions, leave them below or email me, Dustin at workflow.ca, and I'll get back to you. So let's just dive in. A 360 product photo for anyone who's not certain. It can be played like a video essentially and definitely rotating if you have each degree, or it can be dragged back and forth manually by the viewer. This lends it to be very useful in apparel and certain kinds of e-commerce. You can really flatter anything if you capture it in a 360 space. So aside from that, our bare bones setup is completely normal. We got a Nikon D5100 and that's sporting a Yong Nuo flash kit, which I'll link below. So that's a really economic setup and you know that if you've been watching us for a minute. And of course we got our speed light adapter attached to a strip box, eight by 36 inch. And I just raised that up right above our product. That'll be a really reliable setup. And having a reliable setup is extremely important with a 360 product photo because you could capture up to 360 images. You can't have things bending or moving around. So that's a nice static setup. Whenever I'm shooting any kind of product, I'm gonna to wanna to center it on my table. It helps the lighting react symmetrically. But with a 360 product photo, it's vital you nail the center. You don't want your item to wobble at all. You want it to rotate along that center axis perfectly. And you may take some time to adjust that nicely. It's way more obvious with a cylindrically shaped item. And one thing you can do to begin to combat that is turn your grid lines on in your camera. So you wanna use the grid lines just to make sure the front and back of your item are centered, like the front and back bead here, for example. So on the 180th degree rotation, theoretically the back should be perfectly aligned, but more importantly, it'll be in the focal range as well. Another way we can prevent wobble is just run a quick test by turning our turntable on. So when it's rotating, even 45 degrees, we can set that through our smartphone, we can check through the guidelines and we'll see if it's wobbling outside of the guidelines significantly. Now, even a little millimeter distance can sink you, but I'm gonna spin this back and proceed with this and get it straight on and we'll craft the lighting a bit and I'll see how our result ends up. I think it'll be relatively straight and you know, reducing complete wobble can be really tricky and it's still something I'm working on myself. So keep in mind, if we're capturing a 360 degree image, we can't retouch the frames. There could be between 24 and 360 images, depending on the smoothness you wish to achieve. And that's a headache to retouch. Plus if you're replacing organic data with a patch tool, it'll flicker and trust me, you need to get this clean in camera. So we just blasted this to middle earth with the dust blaster, no affiliation, but I do like the product. And hopefully we get it pretty clean. It's just a much different approach to cleaning things up in post-production. All right, so let's check out our lighting here and then we'll send this puppy for a spin. It shouldn't need too much tweaking. It's just a bracelet. So let's just see the bare strip box on the back. And like I said, that's kind of a simple, elegant look for one light, just because the little crescents show up in the beads, which is just kind of flattering, I think, that's nice. You know, there's always aesthetics and then there's conveying the material finish. And what I like here is you can tell what the bracelet would feel and look like almost because the more matte beads are looking matte. The glossy beads have a direct reflection with which matte is unable to produce. So we're definitely conveying that here and I think it looks pretty nice. So we are at F16, but notice we're actually getting significant fall off. It's because I'm zoomed in so much, but I wanted to make the point a shallow depth of field or spatial compression is fine. You can use that as an aesthetic choice with 360 degree product photos and they work fine. Should we do some diffusion? I wanna give you a nice reason to subscribe here so we can get to 100K a little faster. We always use these discs on our channel and they're like a really versatile item a lot of people have. I'm gonna double them up here and just for some diffusion, create a roof over our product. And it's on a clamp there at the back. So it's kind of an informal approach, but it's nice and stable. It'll just add one layer of diffusion, which can give us more gradient to our highlight, give us a bigger highlight. And with an item like gloss, it can still really flatter it. So it's an easy A-B test to run. And let's do it. That's an ABC task, say, double dipped. I think I want to get something even more enveloping for the highlights. So why don't we adjust this back clamp a little? If we lower this, we can kind of close off that gap there and escape any light from leaving. And that should theoretically give us a bigger highlight. Yeah, something like that. I like when a big highlight completely hugs the whole shape of the object like that. It gives you a good idea of the material finish still. 
Great, so now we're happy with our whole diffusion setup here and we can move on to the automation in our smartphone. Now each interface will be unique, I assume. I've only used this one, but the main thing you're looking out for is number of rotations. This is a variable, it's up to you. You can talk to your client, but this will affect the smoothness of the result, but it'll also affect the load time of the product itself, because that's a lot of imagery to be spinning. So our rotations here are set to 120 for this example, which may be overkill, but it's just that an example. And it's still completely manageable with automation. I mean, you could go grab some milk from the fridge and come back and this thing's done. It's really file sizes you're talking about. Now you can use the built-in firing mechanism with your capsule or your camera's built-in intervalometer, which I did here, to sync with the rotations. Now my flash is at an eighth power here and it's pretty much keeping up fine. We'll see in a moment if it starts slowing down and you start sweating bullets. But if I needed a high flash power, I would just set the table to a slower speed to account for a flash recharge. But it's pretty obvious in a few exposures if you are sustainable and we are looking good here. So I'm gonna let this keep firing and just do its magic. I'll go get my glass of milk. Thumb up this video, guys, and let's meet up inside the computer and I'll run you through my editing workflow. Okie dokie, so we are inside a camera raw and the reason is we just dragged all our raw photos inside Photoshop. We got some nice smooth rotations and then this is where you know, you end up by default. And I might make a few quick adjustments. Maybe I'll adjust the whites and I'll hold alt. I'm not looking to clip it onto white, but just get it somewhat bright here. And compared to the original, it looks a little nicer. And in terms of the black point, I don't want to clip anything because that'll literally lose the data down there. I want to keep it not legible, but I want to keep it within reason. And I might even improve the shadows a bit, not to totally um, bring up those beads, but just give some detail to them. And that's a really simple thing. Let's just quickly go over to sharpening. I'll sharpen this guy a little bit. And normally I would take the time to sort of, you know, do the image respect. If I'm going to be taking the time to put it in a 360 space anyway, I want it to look nice. A little bit of noise reduction. I did a few different runs with different settings. I'm trying a crazy one right now, ISO 1250 at F29, just to go crazy deep depth of field. That's actually probably not ideal for a 360 photo. Probably stick with more of a, ISO 100 kind of thing, so there's no difference, but there's a bit of overcast, so I went for it. And let's just move over to enable lens profile correction, and I'll do that. So nothing crazy, but a series of changes. I'm not going to touch the clarify, or pardon me, the clarity. I'm going to grab everything, control A, synchronize, and I'll hit. Okay, so I'll sync everything across that, and then that is fantastic. Now let's take a quick look at frame zero, just so I can explain something really quick. So unless you're shooting a small item like this, or you're shooting at a certain angle, it can be tricky to crop within a sort of clean space for the aesthetic of your website. Like they're usually not the biggest tables, but you can photograph a lot of different size things on this. I wanna show you a really quick way you can clean up these negative spaces. If you did need to get rid of them for the crop, I could probably survive with it out here. But let me show you how you could quickly get rid of that. Cause your instinct might be to wanna maybe even crop the product out if you can grab it with a white perimeter and click this button down here to give it a mask. And then below that, you can create a white layer and you can have all your layers scaled out like this and apply that mask. Now you can still see the difference if your eyes are good or you're on a certain monitor. It is not on white. Now you could use something to boost that above that or change your settings in raw, but I wanna do something a little bit different, which I typically do, which is a bit easier. And you can again, scale this out. It's just making a selection, but you know, getting it above the product. And I do this often, as long as the layer is not a smart layer, it's rasterized, hit control T, and then that gives you your bounding box and you can just drag this up. You can hold shift if you need it to be perfectly straight. And that's a much quicker way just to get a clean slate to begin with. So even if you're not putting it to a clean pure white space, it just looks clean intuitively because everything's uniform. Instead of using the eyedropper tool to check for brightness, I like to pull the curves down and just see what is gray versus what is pure white. If you ever want to fake it, you can use the selective color just to sort of kick the bright gray to absolute white. And sometimes I do that with that curves layer present just so I can really see it's a good litmus test. And that is definitely a pure white perimeter. The only problem with stretching the image like that is sometimes the areas that were already bright, you start to lose them a little bit into the brightness. So I could even go on that layer, hit G, and do a black radial gradient in the middle of that mask. That omits the effect relative to the darkness here. And that's a nice solution because now we're confident we have a white perimeter but we're not straining the middle of the image, which is close to white. It's almost 
you know, visibly white, it's bright gray. And I just wanted to show you that to convey, you can apply effects like this to get a uniform look across all your exposures really easily. Let me do it real quick. A lot of the times in product photography to stack a bunch of JPEGs, which is what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna stack all of our JPEGs. I go to files, load files into stack, browse. And a lot of you are familiar with this. And then I have them all here exported in a folder. So I'll just grab them all, hit okay. It'll take a second to chew through that. So let's open these here. So before we do anything, I just wanna go image and reduce the size, image size, just so my computer's not dying while I'm trying to show you this. We can have a coherent discussion. Okay, now that we're a bit more manageable, we're gonna use an action to do that automated sequence. So you can go to window action to use that. I have mine down here in this doc. So we're gonna click new action down here. I'm gonna name it whatever, whatever set. And let's just pick a function key, shift F7, why not? So I'm gonna hit record. So now anything I do in this recording can be scaled out across all of our images. So let's go to layers. We're already on our top layer and I'll try to do this kind of quickly. We already did it. I'll just make a marquee selection above the layer. Hit control T and drag that upward. I'll hit enter and control D to deselect. So that kind of neutralized our shooting surface like last time. Now we want to do the selective color effect. So we're going to go effect selective color and I'll pull all of these down which should get this to crisp white, but remember it kind of affects the middle negatively. I'm gonna hold Alt in between these frames and click. That'll clip it to just that layer, which is great. Let's click the layer mask, hit G. I'm gonna click in the middle, holding Shift towards the outer bracelet and let go. So I'll grab these top two layers and Control E to merge them. And that completes our recorded action sequence. So let's go to actions and hit stop. And now that you have that set up, if you wanted to do that edit to everything easily, you can grab any frame you want, each frame, and hit Shift F7, and it will do the effect for you. Now, the only thing I don't like about this is you seem to have to go to each image and separately click Shift F7. Which takes a click here and there, but it's nice to be able to scale out those adjustments over everything if you do want a bit of a more sophisticated look. Okay, then we'll just grab all our JPEGs, whether they're unretouched, heavily retouched, or mildly retouched like we did here, and we'll bring them into our online 360 product photography software. We're using ArcSpin today just because it's free and it's online. I'll link it below. Okay, so here we are on ArcSpin.com, and I'll link that below. I just created a free account, and I'm just using this one because it's really easy, and you can just sort of test your stuff out when you're just starting. So I'll grab all my frames here, and we'll open them up, and it'll just take a second to chew through those frames. Okay, here we are. And in terms of wobble, uh, we're looking decent. We're mainly centered. Like I said, the Photoshop adjustments could have helped a little bit. Uh, one thing I do like is these sort of jewels back here really shimmer nice in the 360 and they catch different lights, which can be flattering. One thing I do notice when I whip around is a slight flicker effect. And that's caused by, like I explained, I had a few different setting options and I tried a few higher ISO ones. In hindsight, I should have mitigated ISO. It seems obvious in hindsight. I definitely enjoyed using the MyOps Capsule 360 table and I'd give it a positive review. I'll link below where to check it out if you want to, you know, stay productive at home and maybe learn a new genre in product photography. So take care guys, make sure to leave me a comment about 360 product photos, your tips, your suggestions. I'm looking forward to learning with you. Like I said, I'm newer to this genre and I'd love to hit you back up in like six to eight months once it's a more standard part of my workflow. Cause I think 360 product photos are just a natural extension of product photography. And it's such a value added thing you can provide to your clients. It's like a no brainer. So I'll be in touch a lot more on the way and take care folks. Goodbye.